All right, to wrap up our conversation about factor markets, we're going to now take a look at labor markets. It's important to understand that we are still essentially assuming that the markets we're discussing are competitive. And in fact, anytime that you rely upon the supply and demand framework to tell a particular economic story, you are in a sense assuming competitive markets. So going back to those assumptions we discussed in chapter four, uh, what makes a competitive market? You know, the, the key assumption of, of what makes a, a market competitive is that the supply and the demand of that product is made up of a lot of entities. So there's a lot of consumers for the product and there's a lot of suppliers for the product. This helps the market to be competitive. And anytime you reduce the number of consumers or you reduce the number of producers, the market may grow uh, non-competitive over time. We will certainly analyze what happens to markets when they become less competitive and what this means for like the overall health of an economic system and what this means for the health of the markets themselves. But, but for now, and for this beginning part of this, this discussion on labor markets, we're going to assume that the labor market is competitive. Just like the capital market, we can discuss labor market as being about supply and demand. Now, we could have in the previous uh, lecture video discussed capital markets as merely being about the supply and demand of the actual uh, capital itself. But of course, this would miss, again, the important component that capital investment uh, almost always comes from debt-generated financing. And so it's really important for us to add that additional layer of complexity to our conversation about capital markets, because again, it's our way of, of, of being theoretical, but also adding in reality. Now, for the labor market, we're going to think about it a lot more straightforward. So the way we're going to think about labor markets is that there are labor markets for distinct sets of skills. This is, I think, the easiest way to think about labor markets. So in other words, you could have a labor market for computer coders. You could have a labor market for carpenters. You can have a labor market for plumbers, right? And depending upon the way in which those individuals interact with the broader economy, they may be hired by a firm or directly from individuals. It really doesn't matter whether it's about a firm employing an individual or even if it's just simply about an individual performing a service that someone hires directly. We can still think about that in the context of a labor market. Now, the key point of the labor market to keep in mind is that the demand for labor uh, this comes from firms. So firms demand labor. Now, why do firms demand labor? Well, firms demand labor because they're maximizing profits. So the demand for labor curve comes directly from profit maximization of firms. So in other words, if we think about it, firms in this part of the labor demand curve are willing to pay high wages to their employees. And we may assume that these are profitable firms. And then as we move down along the demand curve, we can see that uh, increasingly there are more firms in the market, the lower the wages go. And we can kind of think about these firms and, and the bottom part of the labor demand curve as being the less profitable firm. The less profitable you are, the less wage you're going to be willing to uh, pay. So we can, again, we can think about the demand curve here as a willingness to pay curve. It's just that here, willingness to pay is not about buying a product. It's about compensating someone for their time. So I'm willing to pay someone X amount of money to compensate them for a service that they provided to me. Again, either as an employer, as a direct employer, uh, or as sort of a contract situation, like with plumbing and carpentry, which often are individuals who are um, sole proprietors. They own their own businesses. Um, but that is sort of an extraneous detail. It's not super important. The supply of labor comes from individuals. And again, like consumption, the supply of labor is going to come from a utility maximization process. Uh, essentially, we can think about consumers as having what we call intertemporal utility. And what this means is that we, we can think about utility as about being about, you know, individual consumption decisions right now. Or we can think about utility as a, a series of decisions that we make over the course of our lifetime. 
And of course, one of the most important decisions that we make over the course of our lifetime is what uh, occupation are we going to go for? What job do we want? You know, and when we hit that age where we have to hit the labor market, what do we actually want to do? And of course, that choice guides the, the education you get, it guides the city you live in, um, it guides a lot of your decisions, and it certainly guides your willingness to supply that labor, right? So the supply of labor comes from a utility maximization process, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, just like before with uh, capital markets, again, we can think about marginal product of capital, um, oops, uh, as being a simple sort of idea where, you know, the uh, ability to produce relative to increases in labor. And this is going to be in the same way that the marginal product of capital determined the amount of capital that a uh, firm would purchase. This is also going to be the case with the marginal product of labor. Um, just like we did with the marginal product of capital, we want to think about this in the context of the value of the marginal product of labor. Um, and so if we could just scroll down here, we can see here that we have a labor market over here to the left, and then we have an individual firm's uh, value of marginal product of labor curve. Um, and so again, this is the labor market. This is the market that the firm is um, employing their employees from. And then depending upon the wage, how the wage is set in the labor market, this is a, going to determine how many employees the firm hires. Okay, so it's just like before when we talked about this idea of constrained optimization. Whether it's purchasing capital or, or whether it's hiring labor, firms are constrained in their ability to do so, not just by their own decisions, but also by the decisions of those exogenous factors. So again, this is a labor market here, and it sets a wage rate, okay? Let's imagine for a moment that first, the wage rate was $15 per hour. Okay, so what the firm does is the firm says, okay, I'm generally gonna have to pay $15 an hour to entice people to work for my firm. Okay, so then the firm sits down, they look at their marginal product of labor, and they determine, uh, you know, where the point on their marginal product of labor curve is equal to $15. Because again, just like we talked about with capital, if we're hiring like a very, very little amounts of labor, we can see that the, the marginal product, the value of those labor units is, is higher than the wage rate, meaning that we're, we're getting more in terms of profits, uh, in terms of product uh, here than we're actually paying. And so we'll keep hiring labor until, just like we saw before, the wage rate is equal to the marginal product of labor. Now let's take a step back here. Um, for a lot of students, this might be a little confusing, just like it was for the capital market. What's important to understand here is that essentially what the wage rate represents is the marginal cost of hiring labor, right? So if I want to hire an additional person, I'm going to have to pay them $15 an hour. So that's my marginal cost of hiring an additional person. And then the marginal product of labor is the extent to which hiring that person will add a particular amount of value to my business. So in early stages of labor, I'm hiring individuals who bring me in a lot more value than I pay them in terms of their wage. But then as I hire more and more and more because of diminishing returns, I know that eventually it's no longer going to be feasible, and in this case profitable, if I continue to hire individuals. So where do I stop? where I stop when the marginal cost is no longer equal to the marginal benefit. And what's marginal benefit here? Marginal benefit is the value of the marginal product of labor. Just like the marginal benefit um, for the capital market was the marginal product of capital, the value of the uh, marginal product of capital. And so again, this is just a marginal benefit, marginal cost situation, just like we've talked about repeatedly throughout the course. So firms will hire employees up until the point where the marginal cost to do so is equal to the marginal benefit of doing so. And here, marginal benefit is illustrated by the value of the marginal product of labor curve. And then whatever the wage rate is, this will determine how much labor the firm hires. Now, let's imagine that 
we see the labor market has an increase in the demand. This means that for whatever labor market this is, firms are seeing an increase in the demand for that specific skill set. So for example, this could be computer coding in the early 2000s. The demand for computer coding skills went way up, and as a result, the wage rate being paid to computer coders rose as well. Well, when the wage rate rises, we see that the optimal amount of labor to be hired is lower than it was previous, which should make a lot of sense. Nothing else has changed here. All that's occurred is an exogenous factor, which is that the demand for labor purchased by this company increases. So the wage rates are now higher in that labor market. And as a result, the profit maximizing level of labor for the firm is now going to be lower. Um, now, of course, the firm could make internal changes. Maybe they become a little bit more efficient. Who knows? But for now, we're just going to keep it in this static sense. We're only going to change the demand for labor, which increases the wage and causes the firm to now hire less labor, which is a little bit, I would say, counterintuitive. If I were to tell you that the demand for labor rose, what do you think this means for like every individual firm in the market? Well, you might think to yourself, well, this is a, if demand for that labor rose, this means firms are hiring more. But the consequence of firms hiring more or trying to hire more is that the wage rate has risen. And so, in fact, what's going on is, like, let's say, for example, this demand increase is because there are new firms in the market. So new firms enter the market, they drive the wage rate of computer coders up, and as a result, existing firms now hire fewer uh, computer coders as a result. And so there's a lot of balancing and counterbalancing in an economic system. So despite the fact that computer coders are now being paid higher amounts uh, of money because the labor market has improved for them, it may take a while for firms to actually be able to hire uh, individuals at that wage, given that, again, as long as their pr productivity relative to labor stays the same, then they actually are going to hire less labor with this new higher wage rate. Now, again, the firm could improve their productive ability. That would, in a sense, cause the marginal product of labor curve to shift out. And if that's the case, then we can see even an increase in wage to 20 would also uh, correspond to a higher level of employment than we have here. So you know, that's really something that you can do in this in, in microeconomics is that you can always shift curves around and see what happens. So for, for example here, I just imagine that we have a shift of the marginal product of, of labor curve um, for, the, for the firm. This means that each unit of labor is more beneficial to them than it was prior. Well, since each unit of labor is now more beneficial to them than it was previously, it may in fact mean that they will now hire more workers. In fact, this is often the case um, as, a, as a counter argument against concerns about automation. So it is under certain circumstances where firms will automate and instead of hiring fewer workers, they actually end up hiring more because each individual worker is now more productive than they were previously. Now, the truth is, is that automation absolutely causes a reduction in labor hiring in certain markets. But there has been, there have been certain circumstances where like early stages of automation, because they made each individual unit of labor more productive, they actually led to increases in hiring. Um, but, you know, again, this is kind of, you know, sort of gets us into kind of technological questions about, you know, what to what level of automation. You know, used to automation was a conveyor belt with maybe some robot arms. Nowadays, automation is, is a whole new thing. Now they have, you know, machine learning programs and, and computer programs that get, can make decisions not that far away from humans. Um, that's really reaching a point of automation where we expect to see fairly large effects on labor markets. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, students are often given the advice um, to uh, find those jobs that... Um, are, are automation proof, right? That even if automation occurs, these jobs are still going to be around. But as far as just basic analysis of labor markets, we can sort of ignore all that. And we, again, we can look at it again, the same way that we look at these two graphs where you have a labor market and then you have an unchanging value of marginal product of labor. And then you can do things to the labor market and you can see how an individual firm would respond. 
So in this case, the demand increased, the wage rate is now higher, the firm would respond by then hiring fewer individuals. Um, you could, again, shift the supply curve. And what you're paying attention to is what happens to wages. Because wages are the cost of employment to firms. And that's the marginal cost component. So when firms are deciding, do I want to hire that next individual, that's the marginal cost. The marginal cost is the wage rate they're going to pay that individual. And so they will hire individuals as long as the marginal cost, the wage rate that they pay their employees is no larger than the value, the marginal value they get from hiring those uh, employees. Um, just like with capital, right? Firms will purchase capital as long as the marginal cost of capital, in that case, the rental rate of capital, is no larger than the value they're receiving. And so just like we've seen before with profit maximization, utility maximization, these decisions of how much capital and labor to employ are optimization problems. Optimization problems in which the firm is being affected both endogenously by their own cost structures and their own production function, as well as being affected exogenously by the capital market and by the labor market. And so running a business is actually this extremely complicated process of understanding your input markets, your factor markets that we've discussed in this particular chapter, as well as understanding the market for your finished product. And you are affected both in your ability to work prior to the to construction of your product, so the, the input process, the production function process, as well as your ability to then actually sell your product uh, to consumers. And so the, the market that you sell your goods in is affecting your profits. The labor markets that you hire your labor from is affecting your profits and the capital that you purchase your, the capital markets that you purchase from for your capital are affecting your profits. And what we simply assume is that labor decisions, capital decisions are profit maximizing decisions. So in that sense, firms will only purchase capital when it makes sense for them to do so. Firms will only hire employees when it makes sense for them to do so. And in this chapter, we've established you know, basically two rules that are simply a retreading of the equimarginal principles that we've already been talking about. And that is that in order to maximize net benefits, in this case, net benefits are profits, total revenues, net of cost. So net benefits are just profits here. In order to maximize net benefits, firms will do something until the marginal cost of that is equal to the benefit they get from it, whether it's purchasing capital or whether it's hiring labor. 